Hello, I'm Avi Lewis. Welcome back to On the Map. Tonight we take a look at the history of the car bomb. From yesterday in Lebanon to, well, almost every day in Iraq, car bombs have become ubiquitous and heavily associated in the popular imagination with the Middle East. In fact, this brutal and indiscriminate weapon has a complex history layered with ironies that stretches back more than 80 years. Since that September day in 1920, when an Italian anarchist named Mario Buda parked a dynamite-packed horse-drawn wagon across from J.P. Morgan and Company, the car bomb has gone global. Car bombs were used by American allies in the Vietnam War. The IRA used 20 in one day. July 21st, 1972, Bloody Friday. Hezbollah took car bombing to a new level in 1983, sending suicide trucks loaded with explosives into American barracks in Lebanon, killing 220 Marines. And of course, car bombing has reached an apocalyptic peak in Iraq. In the fall of 2005, there were 140 a month. That brief history of the car bomb is taken straight from a book called Buddha's Wagon, A Brief History of the Car Bomb. I'm joined now by the author Mike Davis in San Diego. Mike Davis, welcome to On the Map. My pleasure. Now, in your book, you call car bombs an inherently fascist weapon. What do you mean by that? Well, it's a fascist weapon in exactly the same sense that the bombing of cities, that strategic bombing is a fascist weapon. Uh, the concept of collateral damage is inherently uh, an obscene one, and it's almost impossible to conduct a car bombing campaign without killing civilians. Of course, this is precisely what recommends the car bomb to some groups, is the scale of carnage and the level of terror that it's capable of creating. Now, you write about car bombs both as a tool of insurgencies, a sort of classic weapon of the weak against this, uh, a state, um, liberation movements. But you also write about the car bomb as a tool of clandestine uh, campaigns by, by states, by nation states. What's the difference in the way the two sides have used car bombs over, over in historical terms? Well, sometimes it's impossible to find the, the, the difference simply because car bombs are so clandestine they become almost occult events. Bomb goes off in Beirut like on Wednesday and you can have ten different theories as to who the, the protagonists, the architects of the, you know, the bombing were. But basically on the hands of insurgent groups or nationalist organizations, they're an attempt to compensate for the lack of a regular army, the lack of weaponry, the lack of technology. For intelligence agencies, on the other hand, they're perfect for strategies of destabilization, of deliberate terror, of creating tension. Uh, a classical example of this was the car bombing campaign carried out in the late 1980s in Russian-occupied Kabul, sponsored by the CIA and conducted by the Mujahideen. What has the car bomb done to the movements that have used it on the insurgency side? What's the impact on the actual the architects of car bombing campaigns? Well, car bombs, because they're so powerful and cheap and easily utilized, uh, have a great seductive power to insurgent groups. And sometimes those groups ignore the moral price that they pay. The bombs not only you know, kill your enemy, but they'll also destroy your own moral credibility, as both the IRA and the Basque nationalists have discovered. And a fundamental debate occurred in the 19, uh, uh, early 1980s uh, when Nelson Mandela, still in prison on Robbins Island, polemicized against the use of such weapons by the African National Congress, pointing out however effective they may be tactically they end up destroying the dignity and the moral stature of the, of the struggle by the civilian deaths that are, and deaths of innocence are almost certain to occur. Mm -hmm. Do you think car bombs are ever a legitimate weapon? Well, it's a difficult question when you're faced with such unequal struggles uh, in the world as, say, during the Vietnam War between the might of the United States and, and the National you know, Liberation Front. Uh, any civil war, any guerrilla war will produce carnage and, and an appalling act. So it's, you know, this is a very difficult question to answer, but I think Mandela's argument, uh, you know, still has the greater weight that a true liberation movement would not 
use weapons that are almost certain to involve the casualties of innocent people, you know, women and children. Uh, what's morally repellent about a car bomb is the same thing that's morally repellent about the use of air power on a civilian target. You are an urbanologist, and many of your books have been about cities. How are car bombs altering the landscape of, of cities around the world? Well, car bombs, far more than the more sensational or exotic weapons mm -hmm. like the threat of nuclear biological attack, have raised in intractable problems of, of urban security, and not only in the Middle East or in, in Latin America, but think of the examples of, of London or New York City. And the reason is that while you can wall or defend a green zone or a, maybe a few acres of, of a financial center, a weapon that looks like ordinary traffic uh, is undetectable and in a sense you can't defend uh, against it. So it's created new, I think, unfortunately, what will be permanent levels of fear and tension uh, in the cities. It also hastens the movement toward the fortification of urban space and, of course, it's just the perfect ammunition for people who want to assail civil liberties and create, give more powers to uh, the police to regulate our daily lives and surveil our daily lives. Tell me about the role of the CIA in the dissemination of the car bomb as a tactic. The CIA on at least four occasions, beginning in 1952 in uh, Saigon, and recently just this year, according to ABC television in Afghanistan, has deliberately employed uh, car bombs or supported groups that are car bombers. But really the, the key event in the dissemination of urban terrorist technology, the greatest, in fact, terrorist technology transfer in history occurred in the 1980s when CI director Bill Casey sponsored these uh, training schools in terrorism at madrasas and, and camps along the Pakistani border and then authorized a car bombing and urban sabotage campaign not simply against the Russian troops in Kabul, but against the civilian population of Kabul. So what happened in the 1980s is with the blessing of the CIA and the Pakistani intelligence agency, tens of thousands of people were taught state-of-the-art uh, explosives, state-of-the-art urban terrorism, including car bombs. These people went on to teach others. And now you can find tutorials and PowerPoints and everything you need to know about building sophisticated car bombs on the Internet. Mm -hmm. So it was in a very real sense, it was uh, CIA director Bill Casey who opened Pandora's box. What, what, are, the, what are the central well, ironies that you've discovered in your research? Well, you know, the ironies are, 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 are this, that the, you know, the machine upon which we are all dependent and increasingly uh, uh, the entire world, you know, gridlocked in traffic, uh, this machine turns out to be the, the simplest and the most effective explosive delivery device, device that we have. I mean, the, literally the equivalent of a poor man's Air Force. But the other irony, of course, is that the gates of hell have been opened largely by state intelligence uh, agencies who are the ones who are responsible for changing terrorism from something practiced on a kind of artisanal basis on a local level into a kind of universal uh, virus. To the point right now that what we see is just so horrifying and staggering. There have been at least 1,200 fatal car bombings in Iraq, about 40% of them suicide bombings, and they have killed as many civilians as died in London during the, uh, the Blitz during the course of World War II, at least 30,000 people. Mike Davis, thanks for being on the map. My pleasure. Coming up after the break, South Africa shut down. We look at the deeper context of the country's biggest strike since the end of apartheid.